a good Let me start by thanking, as always, Shem Ramuna for being the host of the series. I want to thank the Lehman family, as I always do. There they are in the back for being the series sponsors. Tonight, as you can see, with this uh, lecture is being sponsored by uh, the Grahams, uh, Moira Lee Graham, for his uncle Booty Dubois. Is that the guy who was in Shul at your at your uh, at the Mordechai's? No. Uh, uh, no, was it different? That's a different Dubois. Yeah, I call du Dib different Dubois. Yeah. yeah. You, you see one, you see one two boys, you see them all, you know. It's all, it's all Baltimore family, though. That's that's uh, nice. So, I'm glad to pay tribute to the memory. And in a slightly different vein, uh, Liam Murray told me that uh, the following person needs her full slam. But so let's dedicate everything tonight that Pluma Leia Bas Sima should have a full shlema. There's a lot of ill people, you know, as we know in the communities. I guess that's a, that's a constant. And I do hope that. And it's because we have, and it's from the sponsor especially, should be piled in some degree, hopefully a lot, to improve the health situation. Uh, I do want to, as always, thank the tech team. They're ahead of me in terms of, uh, uh, of efficiency this year. They deserve it. And without any further ado, let's get down to work. The name of the series, of course, is The Last Years Before Oslo, The State of Israel and the Jewish People, 88 to 92. Tonight is lecture 14 out of, I believe, 16. Um, and I changed the title a little bit, but it's Considerations About Non-Orthodox American Jewry and Its Culture in the Late 20th Century. <clears throat> because once I start to write it, these titles come up a long time ago. Once you get down to it, you tweak it a little bit. <clears throat> and without any further ado, here we go. Last week, we, or last time, we looked at one segment of American Jewry. You hear my voice, but I can't help it. We looked at one segment of American Jewry in the late 20th century, and that was the Orthodox, who are about 12%, 10%, something like that, in those years of the American Jewish community. <clears throat> Tonight, let's take a look at the other 90%. <laughs> 90%. That's a lot of people. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> we're talking about the largest Jewish community in history. There has never been anywhere a Jewish community with five, six million people. Halu Dabrahu, okay? And um, the freest. There's no question about that. There has never been in our history a community of Jews who were as politically free as in the USA. The richest. There has never been, I'm saying these statements as a matter of history, there has never been anything close to the wealth of the five, six million Jews in, in, in the USA. Okay? This is a fact. This is why, as you all know, all throughout our lifetimes, we're sending overseas money to other communities. They're not sending it the other way. Okay? You know you're in big trouble when you get a care package from Poland, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, I'll go even farther. There has never been as generous a community in, in, in our history as the American Jewish community. There has never been a community that has been so willing to give up its resources to help others, I'm talking about Jews now, help others around the world, all throughout, you know, for at least 100 years now, maybe 100, 110 years now, or something like this, since the crisis of the First World War, when American Jewry stepped up to the plate, and ever since then, they're providing 99% of all the money that kept the Jews alive in Eastern Europe until the Holocaust, and the refugees afterwards, and the Jews in the Sephardic countries, and the state of Israel, a hundred times over, and you know, ask the fundraisers. You don't get this kind of thing from England, and you know, France, and, and you know, they give a little bit. And America is just a different is, is a different Messias. Okay, it's just a different Messias. Uh, I might say there has never been as powerful, politically powerful, a Jewish community in history as in the USA. You see Truman with Weizmann. Truman didn't necessarily want to recognize Israel, if you know the whole story, but he was pressured, okay? Um, and it's pressured by who? And every president since then <clears throat> has felt a certain type of pressure, okay? Some go along with it, some don't go along with it. But there has never been in England or France or Poland or Germany or Turkey or Spain or anything remotely like it. So most of us live in an environment I don't think we appreciate. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the USA has always been very different and very good for the Jewish people in some respects. No question about it. And it's silly 
to ignore that. Now, it even has reached the point that you could ask a very good question, maybe it's not politically correct to ask, and that is, uh, has American Jewry been protected by Medinat Israel, or has it been the other way around? <laughs> okay? Uh, could they, this is turning Herzl on the head, because Herzl said, to be a Jewish state now, I'll help the Jews everywhere else. But you know and I know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, Israel depended, so far, every day of its existence, on American backing. Okay? I believe even at this minute, the U.S. is sending them billions every year. Besides the political support. You know what I'm saying? You, you don't realize these things often. Uh, and finally, I can make a generalization. American Jewry in its overwhelming majority throughout its history has not been interested in Orthodox Judaism. That's a statement also of a generality. Now, which is interesting. Now, American Jewry is interesting that unlike other countries, the American Jews have never really been able to turn themselves into a Jewish community, which is interesting. Wherever Jews were in back in the old days for a whole bunch of different reasons, external as well as internal, they formed Jewish communities, kehilot as they call it. Despite the freedom to do so, there's nothing in the world stopping voluntarily all the Jews in America or even in Baltimore, all the Jews, from forming together into a dues-paying, voting uh, Jewish community. And precisely because of the individual freedom of the individual, and particularly the uniquely um, American separation of church and state, which goes back to Thomas Jefferson. So you can do anything you want over here, and yet they have not been able to do so, perhaps precisely for that reason. But it's an interesting feature, one of the broad generalities that I'm calling to your attention that you don't notice, which differentiates you know, the American Jewish community uh, from others. The traditional Jewish practice of creating a kehila did resonate 100 years ago, 120 years ago, uh, among thoughtful, um, educated Jewish leaders who tried to organize these secular Jewish communities in America in the early years of the 20th century. I don't know if you know about this or not. There's the book by Professor Gurin about the attempt to set up what they call the Ekehila in New York City in the first decade of the 20th century, in time of Teddy Roosevelt, in other words, in Taft. And it was led by the quote unquote demachers, the best and the brightest. And they did it for the best of reasons. You know, a guy, a police a commissioner said all the too many Jews in jail. You understand? And, uh, you know, juvenile delinquents and that sort of thing, which was true at that time. And uh, they said, well, we got to organize it, we'll do a better job. And so here you had, I would say, some of the best minds at that time, around 1900, whatever. Uh, they weren't from, but they were educated. And they, I would say they had a passionate Jewish heart. And they said, why can't we organize it? Not like in Europe, but on a democratic basis, an efficient American Jewish community to deliver in an organized, efficient way the services and things like that here in the good old USA. Uh, the guy who dreamed this up was uh, the famous reform rabbi, Judah Magnus. Who, uh, who quit, being, he had a plush job at the Temple Emmanuel. Uh, he was a reform rabbi from Oakland. And uh, he married the right girl, you know, he met the, the, a rich girl from uh, Louis Marshall's the sister or sister-in-law, something like that. And if he wanted to, he could have had a long career in that show, which paid $25,000 in the time of Teddy Roosevelt. Think about that, okay? But he couldn't take it. He said the reform is, uh, is too weak and so forth. And he wasn't interested in Orthodox, but interested in what he said, conservative. And he was a gadfly. And, he, and by the way, he was also into progressive movement and all that sort of thing with the other Americans. And he said, we should organize it. We have the largest Jewish community in the world. In his time, you had maybe close to 3 million Jews in New York City or something like that, which is larger than the whole Jewish population of the world 100 years earlier, 200 years earlier, you see? And it's ridiculous that we don't have any kind of organization, and every shul does whatever it wants, and everybody makes shoppers for itself, and the kasha is, is, is a chaos, and the chinuch is a chaos, and everything else is a chaos. Why don't we organize? Nothing wrong. And he got, he, he inspired a whole bunch of other people. Uh, again, there are books on this, you know. These were the, the, the movers and shakers of yesteryear, and they weren't from, but they weren't. That's an important point. 
But nevertheless, Shif was the richest guy around. Solomon Schechter, you know. Louis Marshall was the leader of the reform and conservative movements, let us say. He was, he was a, a very big lawyer and very active in Jewish affairs. He was considered, if Taft would have put somebody in the Supreme Court, you know, he was thinking, he's thinking putting him on the Supreme Court. So he was a big lawyer, okay? Oscar Strauss was in Teddy Roosevelt's cabinet, Secretary of Labor and Commerce, okay? I mean, Macy's, you know? Cyrus Adler was the president of this and that and the other. So no, these are names from yesteryear, and they all were educated, and they all were very thoroughly American, and they all were very thoroughly Jewish. And they said, Jews are supposed to have a kehel of some kind or another, and get things organized. They couldn't stand the fact that every group that's coming over is starting another shtibel, and this and that and the other, so it's a chaos, you understand? And everybody's right. Listen, the Frum didn't like it either. Everybody says, I'm a rub, I can make a get. <laughs> you understand? That's what they're doing. Everybody gave a hacksher. Everybody, you know, you know, you know what life was like at that time. And so the the Jewish sen- sensibility, whether Orthodox or non-Orthodox, was for order in Jewish life. Okay? That's always been, you wouldn't know it necessarily, it's always been a dynamic from within Judaism. The stronger the Judaism, the stronger the desire for some kind of an order. But how the heck do you do that in the land of the free and the home of the brave, where everybody can tell everybody where to go? You said we have separation church and state. It's a problem. Okay? Now what do you so basically, now their approach was a very unfrom approach, because they were not from Jews. I want to be very explicit about it. They were not fundamentalists, okay? And that's who they are. They don't believe in the Torah being from God or anything like that. But having said that, they were very good Jews, okay? And so really, it's like the story of the Kuzari, where the king had a, had a dream, where he was told, Kavanos Ritsuya, Masechem Ritsuya, your intentions are good, right? Just the way you're going about it are unfortunate, but your intentions are definitely good. What evolved instead, because the kill never worked. They had meetings, they, they did form a group. It was an interesting experiment for a couple of years. I want you to understand, they went to the Orthodox rabbis and says, help us and we'll organize the Kashrus in, 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 in New York City, let's get some laws passed, you know, bring some order into all this sort of thing. And they wanted education, as we'll talk about in a second. Kavanos uh, Ritsuya, but Masechen Ritsuya. And so instead, instead of this becoming a reality and becoming a model for other cities, so the Chicago, Baltimore, Philly, Detroit, St. Louis, everybody else would copy them, which was the plan. The whole thing fell apart. And instead, we had what evolved in America, as you and I know, or what I call the faux kehilot. Okay? The faux kehilot, which is, is, it has the form sort of of a community. It's not really a community. It's not really a community because it's not elected. And the only thing that makes a real community is there's some kind of representation, okay, and a responsibility to the voters. That's the only real community. You have a shoal. A shoal is a community because you got a board of directors, you have elections, and the members have a say. You understand? Whatever the, the club is. So these are faux communities, Kehilo. They've been offering, they're not elected, but they offer services. They offer services. It's, it's a different model. As we know, in the course of the last 100 years, these faux Kehilo were able to raise Hundreds of millions. That's a fact. So what gives you your power is you're sitting on a, on a pile of money. Okay? In the USA, if you have a budget that you can spend, that's a power. Okay? That's a power. I'm giving it to you and not to you. I'm going to give cats something for this thing. I'm not going to give it to somebody else for that. That's a power. Right? Now, there have been pluses. But this is different than the kehilo, the communities that, that developed in other countries around the world throughout Jewish history. There have been plus and minuses to this system, as you and I know. On the one hand, it certainly has provided uh, certain communal services, and it has tried to do so in an organized manner. After all, we do want JCCs. I want a place to go swimming. We do want Jewish hospitals, and we do want Jewish old age homes, among other things. Um, Some members of the Jewish community, not all, use them. I think a Jewish space is a good thing, is my opinion. On the other hand, to be really a Jewish space, uh, the hospital should be used exclusively, overwhelmingly by Jews and staffed exclusively and overwhelmingly by Jews. That you do not have, okay? That maybe you had in the 1920s and 30s when this idea first started, but not at that time. 
So, like every else, everything else in America, the folk Yehila ideas, you know, evolved in certain ways. On the other hand, the fact that the leaders, the people who control the money, are not really elected, not by the public, cannot help but foster a culture of officious pekidim, a condescension culture, because you, you know, you go to them and you need them, and they're looking down at you. It's out and there's no sense of responsibility to you. So this is the plus and the minus of it. The worst, of, of course, of all, as we all know, was the fact that from day one, the community sought, and it makes 100% sense, to bring order and control over the education system, over the chinuch. This goes back literally, literally 100 years, okay? To the Gale and the First World War period and afterwards. Now, um, here the problem, of course, is these people were not from, they certainly were divorced from fundamentalism. The kind of education that they set up in boards of education and curriculums and schooling and staffing and all the rest of it, it's the wrong model. It didn't leave the kids with any kind of strong sense of Judaism. And from a firm perspective, it's just all uh, basically up courses. So um, in other words, let's put it this way. From day one, the federations have always been anti-day schools. Okay, that's how it goes. Now, um, today things are different because we're in the 21st century and it's collapsed and so forth. But I'm talking about for many, many decades, and anybody who they or their parents were connected with the establishment of any kind of day school context in the 20th century, and I'm looking around, I see a few people like that, will tell you with uphill battle and then give me help from the Federation. And that's the way it went. Now, as a result, you have a century of organized and well-funded amorasis, which is amazing, because they poured in a ton of money, I mean a crazy amount of money into these things, and they still do. I'm saying, besides the Judaic ignorance, because from day one, the school system cut off any intention of dealing with what we would call the mission of the Talmud and the Torah Shabbat, anything like that whatsoever. Second of all, uh, as you know, how much can you do in a Sunday school? How much can you do in an afternoon school? And anyway, the kids are wiped out from the end of the day. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There's all been a grand, terrible experiment, but nobody was allowed to say that. The emperor had clothes, you see, and so the money kept being funded every year, and uh, you know, the teachers didn't know anything, and they're sharing what they don't know with the students. And this is the story of 20th century, but besides the Judaic ignorance, there was an inability to equip the young Jew of the 20th century for the challenging environments of college, the workplace, and shall I say the Benos Moav, <laughs> okay? How do you deal with the challenges that young American Jews, boys and girls, are gonna face, because the kids are going to public school, are gonna face when they get to college, when they get in the workplace, and then when we meet others who are not Jewish. Has, uh, well, tell me what the Talmud Torah, what the day school, I mean, what the Sunday school, and all the rest of it have to say in those subjects. You see the problem. Now, as we know today from a century of experience, only two things work in enabling those young Jews when they get to those points in life to have at least a chance. There's no guarantee of anything, no guarantee of anything, but at least have a chance. And nothing else works. One is a fundamentalism, as you see over here, and the other one's Aliyah. Right? They're different in their nature, perhaps, but, you know, I'm just saying a sociological statement here and not a religious statement. If you want, right, and anybody who challenges this has to answer to the 21st century, you know. Um, what else works? Nothing works. Now, what has been the result? Look at the statistics. This I got from Gabe Aronson. One of these days he sent me... Well, he's my numbers cruncher, he's very interested, he lives in Israel now, on doing the numbers of the Pew reports and statistics and all the rest of it. And I asked him, I said, there's so much material, so much work, can you just give me a, a page? You understand? A page, and he's a natural on this. And look what we're looking at, crunching the numbers. In the, 20, in the Pew study in, released in 2021, now, you have to pay close attention to this because you'll be misled by a line or two. So f hold your opinion until you get to the end. Okay? The current intermarriage rate is 42%. Uh, 
In other words, 42% of the current married couples that included one spouse, included a non-Jewish spouse. And as we're going to see, that's actually not accurate. What it means is even people your age. Okay? And we're interested really in the trends. But let's see, go on. Intermarriage rate broken down by affiliation. Intermarriage, 2% Orthodox, 25% Conservative, 42% Reform. Jews in their religion, 68%. Intermarriage is more common with those who married recently. If it's after 2010, 61, oh, so it's not 42, it's 61. It was married in the 2000s, 45. In the 90s, 37. In the 80s, 42. Look at this, before the 80s was 18%. So it means that the big smash, crash, which I'll try to hope to speak about later, happened in the 80s and 90s. We can say this now because we have historical perspective. Look back 30, 40 years, and these are the number of crunches. I'm not saying the number is exactly 100% correct. Um, Fully 99% of intermarried couples plan to raise, of in married couples hope to raise their kids to Jewish in some way. 70% intermarried couples plan to do so, and that's a lie. It's a lie. Okay? Now, what I mean to say is, I threw the numbers at you because numbers are important, and I want to share them with you, and not, I want to be transparent. But if you do the math, it means the current intermarriage rate for the last 15 years is 72%. That's a big number, okay? The current intermarriage rate. So I'm not talking about people your age who got married back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and all the rest of it, you see? I'm talking about people who got married, let's say, from the late 80s, the 90s, and the 21st century. And there, it means like this. If you're in, this, if you're in, in such and such a community, and you have a son who ended up marrying a Jewish girl, you say, ooh, ooh. <laughs> What happened? <laughs> well, <laughs> you see, that's very sad. That's actually very sad what I said. You see, I made fun out of it, but it's very sad. Now, um, I'll be, get back more to this in a minute. Having criticized the American folk community, let's take a moment to consider the folk community phenomenon in Jewish history. I have in the past pointed out that back in Europe and such places, there had once upon a time been real communities, Gaylot, which for a long time were autonomous as well as coercive, right? Real communities. So long ago, 200 years ago, let's say, for example, you were legally, by the law of the state, a member of the Jewish community, and you had to conform to the norms of the Jewish community. You understand? And if you did, there was some price to pay. In the course of Jewish history, there are times they could kill you, beat you up, this, that, the other, financial, whatever it is. But it's like living in Baltimore City or the state of Maryland, the United States of America. It's called laws. You break a law, there's supposed to be a penalty. That's what I mean. Okay? The nature of penalty varies from community to community and century to century. But there it was. We all know this. Okay? However, these Jewish communities were always, because of the nature of the Gullahs, uh, local. They always occupied a local level. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, repetition. This town has a kehillah, this town has a kehillah, this town has a kehillah. The kehillah be 10, 15 families, another one, same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. And they were all independent. Berlin cannot tell Hamburg what to do. Rome cannot tell Venice what to do, and so on and so forth. By Jewish law, these are the norms of the Jewish law. You can make a takana or something like that within your kehillah, but it doesn't extend outside. Only the areas under your jurisdiction. This is how the Jewish polity evolved. It wasn't that they got together in a Congress somewhere and passed anything because the Jews never got together. And that's my point. That's my point. What about the national level, the Kalal Yisrael level? For the Jews as a people, as a nation, no kehilo of any sort ever developed, which is interesting. So from the time you end, the Jews are kicked out of Israel, more or less, the Sanhedrin goes down to tubes, all the rest of it. Ever since then, there's never been a national Jewish kehilo to consider things. That, so, we, so we have a tradition of Kehillah, but at the tiny level, okay? There wasn't even an attempt. That's why I always like to point out when I give a college course on the first day, one of the interesting things about Jewish history for a non-Jewish audience is that the Jews survived as a people, as you see on the board, despite the absence of a political state. Ever since the Romans burned down Jerusalem, we do not have a political state. Ever since then, until Israel, but you know, all these centuries. We've never had a church since the temple was destroyed and the Sanhedrin went down the tubes. So there's never been a central body to which all the Jews listen to. 
Okay, that's what church is. You know, you've got groups around the world that don't have a state or have gone in history of periods without a state, but they had some supreme religious structure. The Armenians come to mind, you know, things like that. But uh, the Jews, none. It wasn't even an attempt. I always say the Jewish religion is the uh, religious version of what's the name? Uh, who is the humorist? Rogers? Will Rogers. Remember Will Rogers used to say, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. You know what I'm so, yeah, Orthodox Jews, I'm not a member of any kind of organized thing. I'm a Orthodox Jew. Do it never even tried. And thirdly, it's not even the Jews all live in the same place. That might have kept them together. Let's go to the next map. Here is a, a you know Jewish communities. Okay? There's no geographical contiguity between them. Right? What, what, what has this got to do with this? <laughs> what does Poland and all this have to do with people living in France and England? They're not near each other. That's the way that's called Gaulus. They had no choice. It was as circumstances, you know, provided. And the Jews made the best of what they could. They made the best of, best of they could. Mind you, it was possible, if they had tried, for the Jews to organize on some kind of national level. It wasn't that kind of persecution. It wasn't that kind of persecution, even in the Middle Ages, where they wouldn't allow Jewish communities to get together, maybe not to organize a political state, but organize a national Jewish organization, you see? But um, they didn't even start to think in these terms until Herzl came along. This old shot with Theodor Herzl, who said, we, we are a, a, a people, okay? We are one people. Uh, yeah, Freud would say, yeah, yes, but he said, but then we should act like one people. So this was new, this was his contribution to Jewish history. That's why I said many times, the Zionist movement started was a, to a certain degree a smoke and mirrors, because they didn't actually represent an electorate, Okay, so to a certain degree with smoke and mirrors. But on the other hand, they captured the imagination of people with the image of a Jewish parliament. So it's, it's, it's you know, really smoke and mirrors, you understand? It's, it's, you get the image, because he was a PR expert, he was a journalist. So you understand PR. I'm serious about this. So it looks like a Congress. And therefore, it partakes of a Congress, and if it fooled the British, <laughs> it fooled the Europeans, did they give it, well, understand this well, when they gave Palestine in 1917 Balfour Declaration, they gave it to the, to the Zionist organization, because they represent all the Jews of the world. That, we know that. Okay? Now, Herzl himself did not and could not spell out the exact definition of that ringing phrase that we are a people. What does a people mean? Are you saying we're all the same religion? We all have the same culture? Do we all belong to the same ethnicity? To the non from the exact definition of the Jewish identity was a mess. I mean, many, for example, the reform movement in this country, so I guess Judaism is just a religion. You don't want to be accused of dual loyalty. So you have Isaac Mayer Wise, he says, oh my goodness, it's just a religion. Which therefore what he means to say is like this, I don't care what's happening to the Jews in Russia if they're not religious, because I'm an American. I care what happened to Americans. I don't care what uh, uh, Jews elsewhere. He said that was a hard sell. Uh, and is there a religious basis for that? No, that's one of the things the reform movement made up. I'm serious, you can read these things from the American Jew Council of Judaism. Jeremiah said, pray for the welfare in the country in which you live. From that, you're making a whole thesis that the Jewish people are not a people. It's self-serving. Usually when people come with definitions, you and I are the same, come with definitions, it's self-serving, okay? Now, what if, you're, I mean, cause what if you're not religious, so you're not Jewish? Is this what he was saying? What if you don't believe in God? You're not Jewish? I mean, if it's a religion, you're not Jewish. Reform Judaism did not know how to fit the secular masses of Eastern Europe into this. And that's why it's kind of funny, because they evolved their idea of Judaism as strictly religion eh, around 1890. And just then they got hit with a wave of a couple million Eastern European Jews who did Yiddish speaking and all the rest of it, in which one cousin is from and the other cousin is not. This guy's a rabbi and his brother's the head of a communist. You know, there was, that was all over the place. And they're all together at a Seder. So what's he saying? You can't come here because you're not religious? You know what I'm saying? So those reality whacked them over the head. Okay? Um, but on the other hand, if you know the history of Reform Judaism, and I'm not here tonight to beat up on them on this, they would not surrender their hypothesis until Hitler. Okay? So um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, now, till after the Holocaust, to be perfectly honest. 
Is Judaism a culture? Is that what Herzl meant? We all subscribe to the same culture? What if you're not Jewish, and you're a scholar of Jewish culture, and you're culturally engaged? So whatever is a Catholic guy, actually one of the best historians today, I forget the guy's name, on the Holocaust, is this Catholic guy, oh, the name escapes me, I'm sorry about that. Paul Johnson. Uh, no, not Paul Johnson. And no, I'm, I'm a real historian, not a writer. And what do you call it? No, no, no. He's at maybe University of Chicago or someplace like that. Someone on the, uh, on the YouTube or PBS, something like that. He's really, really good. And he's, he eats and breathes this stuff. He's better than any historian I heard of. He's not Jewish. I mean, he's a Catholic guy. You know, he makes no bones about it. I'm simply saying like this. Does that make you Jewish? He's into Jewish culture. You see? Um, Herzl himself confessed he did not know how to disentangle all this stuff. Because Herzl himself, as you, I think you know, was assimilated Jew. Now, he wasn't so assimilated that he, that he, that he you know, didn't come up with Zionism. But he had Christmas tree. Okay? He had Christmas, well, here's the point. Does the fact that Theodore Herzl has a Christmas tree make him not Jewish? That's the point. You get my point? It's, so you say, it's an anomaly. It doesn't work. I like the world in black and white, easy you know, colors. The guy who's founding the Jewish state doesn't have a Christmas tree. Yes, he does. What do you do with that? <laughs> what do you do with that? Okay. Now, um, and by the way, Herzl lived in the polyglot emperor Franz Josef. Okay. So in, in Austria-Hungary, here's an ethnicity map of Austria-Hungary. So how does it work? You're just a Jew by religion, and you're a member of the, eth the national group which in. So here's Carniolo. Are you a Carniolan of the Jewish faith? <laughs> Is that your identity? You know, because there were plenty of Jews who said were Hungarians of the Jewish faith. Plenty of Jews in Hungary that totally assimilated the Hungarian nationality and all the rest of it. Even the Frumschuls. I have a book at home where a guy, how does it work? This, this Israeli uh, rabbi in the, in the Shtachim. I forget the title. It's like Abdus Shahu or something like Some interesting title. In Ivrit. And he's writing about being a rabbi in modern Israel. Keep us through God, guy. But he also, at the end, had a piece about his grandfather, great-grandfather or something like this, who was a uh, Hersheyan-type rabbi in Vienna um, in the early 20th century. His name was Flesh. It was a shlom of Flesh, I think. And the reason he's writing this because they perished in the Holocaust. There's no grave or anything. So he wants to leave like a, a memory. Okay, and this guy was um, like called Oberlander, you get it? So he learned in Frankfurt and Pressburg, those kind of places. It was the Jews of Western, although very from. And he was a rabbi of not the big shul in Vienna, there was a big Orthodox shul on the Shif Casa. It was like a biggie, but they had satellites. And he was a, a rabbi of one of these satellite synagogues in a suburb of Vienna, like from 1910 to, to, to Hitler or something like that. Um, he's a Hersheyan type guy, you know, you look at him, he has that Western Orthodox style, at least by the, the face. And it was Hungarian shul, meaning these were Hungarian Oberland Jews, Shomer Shabbos, who moved to Vienna for business, that's not Hungary anymore. And they did keep their stores closed on Shabbos, no, they didn't keep their stores closed on Shabbos. What they did was, they did, like the Shulchan Aruch said, you make a deal, with a non-Jewish employee and they get those because you couldn't. I'm trying to show you the old world. It was against the law to keep your store closed on Saturday in Vienna in the time of Franz Josef. It was against the law, so you could not do it. So what they did was each guy asked the rabbi how to do it and they drove up, drew up the appropriate um, contracts. The Shulchan Aruch provides for this. We're not crazy about it, but Shulchan Aruch provides for this. And that's how they operate. In fact, the president of Shul I'm going by memory over here, has on his tombstone, here lies so-and-so, Shomer Shabbos in Vienna. So no, that's how hard it was. Shomer Shabbos in Vienna. Okay? So they're Orthodox Jews, they're Shomer Shabbos and all the rest of it, but they're Westernized Jews of the late, of the early 20th century, late Franz Josef period, and all the money the shul has to, it's in the Constitution, has to be invested in Hungarian royal bonds. You understand? Because you have to be 100% Hungarian patriotic. Right? Of course, when Hungary went down the tubes in the First World War, that was the end of that money. But I'm just trying to show you the mentality, and that was a frumschul, a 
Okay? By the way, this guy, Flesh, is the one, although he didn't know it, who inspired the Beis Yaakov movement. Because Sarah Schneer was a refugee in his shul. He didn't know it. In 1915, 60, running away in the First World War, that she heard his speeches about the greatness of the Jewish woman, and, you know, she went back and made a whole big deal in Poland, as we know. So I'm just trying to show you mentalities over here. We talk about nationality, what are you, who do you identify with. So Herzl himself said, I don't know how to disentangle all this kind of business. I just don't want to get a state. Okay? I just want to get a state. We'll figure it out when we get over there. Or we won't. Okay? Now, no one therefore knew how to define Jewish. I'm talking about the non from. No one knew how to define Jewish. Each group did it out of their own local narrow interests. As we know in the 20th century, Hitler said it's a matter of race, as we all know. See, even if you were a Catholic or a Protestant, but if you had converted sincerely, or your father or mother had converted your grandparents, I'm going to kill you anyway because I define Jewish that way. Right? Now, if it's great grandfather, then it's okay because I define Jew. That's how Hitler went. You know, he went up to a certain percentage of the blood. Okay. I mean, what if somebody came from somebody who was Jewish and converted in, in 1500? You see, so he didn't count that. Now, maybe he would have later. Lenin and Stalin defined Jewish in communist terms. You know, in communist terms, for their purposes. And obviously, Jewish is not a religion. And it's not, in fact, they had trouble trying to figure out what exactly it is. They have no interest in what Jewish really, you know, they're trying to fit it for their self serving purposes. Okay? It was precisely because of this identity mess that Ben Gurion called for total Aliyah. When Israel became a state, Ben Gurion said, I guess all the Jews, or almost all Jews, should move to Israel. Once you're in Israel, as he saw, as he saw it, it's a Jewish state, it's a Hebrew state, you say, these problems, you know, end. Because you're Jewish, Israeli citizen, and Gamarnu. Remember, in his times before the 67 war, Caesar was overwhelmingly Jewish. The Arabs were up in the north, you know, boxed in by the army. And it's a Jewish state, like that. And to him, he said, this is solving the question of what the Jewish identity is. It's a religion, it's a nationality, it's a ethnicity, it's a, it's a profession, you know, whatever it is. You move to Israel. But this is not really, even Ben-Gurion confessed to a certain confusion in his very interesting correspondence with Rabbi Dolgin. I don't know if everybody's old enough to remember, he used to be in, in L.A. Uh, back in the middle of the 20th century, Rabbi Dolgin, he's one of the big success stories from Skokie. And he went there in the 30s, and he turned a conservative show in the Orthodox. At that time, it was very unusual. That's Beth Jacob. I mean, I've never been to L.A., but I know it's the big shoulder. It's the Beth Jacob. And uh, he made the Hillel School and all this kind of stuff, you know, back in the day. And he was a big Zionist. He was big in the Mizrahi. And uh, he said, so that, that's him, without the mustache. You know? And uh, it's very interesting. You can go online, if you can get it in the commentary magazine. In November of 52, they carried a correspondence, an exchange of letters between him and Ben-Gurion. And he wrote to him in English, Ben-Gurion wrote back in Hebrew. And yeah, you can see that, right? This is uh, from Commentary Magazine 52, exchange of letters. And, you know, basically he's, he's basically saying like this, what's the future? How will my grandchildren and how you could have anything to do with each other? And things like this. And Ben-Gurion wrote it back. And he said, you know, I see, I give you respect. You're really thinking about this seriously. These are hard questions. I don't have the answer for myself and all the rest of it, right? And what he was saying is what will ensure Jewish survival in the long term? Now, Dolgan, being an Orthodox rabbi, even though he was a big Zionist, said like this, I'm, these are my words, is a composed down to fundamentalism and nothing else. And that's what he's pushing Ben-Gurion. And Ben-Gurion said, what are we supposed to run a state like the Shulchan Aruch? That's ridiculous, you know? But I'm, I'm telling you what they did back and forth. And Ben-Gurion, of course, didn't say that fundamentalism uh, will enjoy Jewish survival because he wasn't a fundamentalist. But he said living in Israel and studying the Bible, whether it's divine or great literature, you take your pick. But the study of the Bible itself, he argued, will keep the Jews Jewish. Okay? And the, in the correspondence, I'll tell you again, I just put it up so you can look it up yourself. I don't have the time to read it all in front of you, otherwise we would do so, but that would take probably 30 minutes. It's a very interesting correspondence. And it's not so long, but it's not short either. And Ben-Gurion conceded, right? Ben-Gurion conceded in his letter to the guy, he says, there's certainly no chance in chutzlars for Judaism or Jews to survive as Jews 
without the study of the Bible in the original Hebrew. That's interesting, because there's a snowball chance in hell for that happening. Okay? Tell me any Talmud Torah or religious school or this and that and the other you ever heard of that is making a serious study with young Jews of the Bible, let alone in the, in, in, in the original Hebrew. And that's not happening. Okay? So, in effect, therefore, Ben-Gurion was proposing, this is 1952, so we're talking about, what, 70 years ago? Okay. So, uh, Ben-Gurion is an interesting model, and it is an interesting model as long as it lasted. And I'm talking about wrestling with the Bible, perhaps even wrestling with fundamentalism, even to reject it. The wrestling itself is a rich Jewish culture. I, I hear that, if you can keep it going. Okay? I hear that. You get involved, very, you know, you're really interested in the Akedah, Yitzhak, and all the rest of it. Doesn't matter whether it happened or not. If, if you can get people to actually be interested in it, but it didn't happen. This isn't in a model if you can keep bequeathing it to the next generations. And there were in the 20th century a number of Jewish intellectuals, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and afterwards, who did, to my mind, just that. So you're talking about the famous years of names of the big intellectuals in the non-Orthodox community, Martin Buber and Heschel and Petachowski about the Reform and Leo Beck also in the Reform. These are people, if you ever read their stuff, they really were you know, trying to work all this out and struggle with faith and all this kind of business, even if at the end they say, you know, we can't believe. But you know, you're, 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 you're trying, it's, it's an important item to you. The wrestling itself, so notice the Torah might not be exactly true, it might be fictional, but nevertheless, it's the essence of Judaism. Um, which is what is interesting is, in the later decades of the 20th century, along the lines of what I spoke about last time, what hit, attracted more people in the non-Orthodox world who were serious to any degree whatsoever about Judaism, neo-Hasidic again. Okay, neo-Hasidic. Therefore, it's not intellectual, more touchy-feely. It's a different thing. That's what the average American Jew, to the degree they're interested, is interested in that kind of stuff. Okay, so you know, get in touch with your inner self and all that kind of business, uh, neo-Hasidic, okay? Now, that means it's Hasidism without fundamentalism. That's what it's down to. And um, now, mind you, neo-Hasidism leapfrogs the problems of biblical criticism, evolution, theology, all the rest of it. So, that's all there. We're not going to talk about it, but we're more interested in this. And it turns out that, you know, that attracted whoever it attracted. But at the end of the day, all this stuff is tiny. It didn't affect the masses of American Jews. <laughs> it did not affect the masses of American Jews. Halavai, American Jews, would have seriously wrestled with fundamentalism even to reject it and bequeath that struggle to their progeny. <laughs> I said, I wish. Instead, what you had, of course, in the course of the 20th century, was big ignorance. Uh, not rejection of fundamental, just ignorance. If I said the word Jewish fundamental, they probably wouldn't even know what I'm talking about. Uh, remember Kennedy's guy spoke about a vast wasteland TV? The Judaism in America in the 20th century, vast wasteland. It's a, it's a sad, because you have millions and millions, and you have, like I say, the freest, the richest, the most generous, all the rest of it. But what their knowledge is, the knowledge level, knowledge basis, is a wasteland. Okay? There's no real connection between something that was happening at the same time. I talked about it last year, and that was do you have in the late 20th century an explosion of Jewish books by academics? Well, good stuff if you're interested in that, but nobody's interested in it, you see? So there are many famous historians and philosophers. There, there is stuff out there not having to do with fundamentalism whatsoever. But as I see over here, I bet you can't mention, nobody here can name both names. Maybe you can get one. Who? Wrong. <laughs> that proves my point. <laughs> This is Jacob Katz in Israel, and this is Sailor Baron in Colombia. All right? Now, my, th that's my point. And you, by the way, are a more educated, more committed audience, and so forth, you see? Who, between them, I bet you they wrote 50, 60 books, maybe 100 books. I'm serious. Or, or something like that. A lot. Okay? Especially this guy, but he did also. And by the way, his stuff is very good. His stuff is very good. Oh, yeah. Um, but my point is like this. Who do you know out there in America... Yeah, aside, from, aside from Gideon, you know, who do you know out there in America who ever heard of these guys or reads their books in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s, 90s, and so forth? So there's a huge disconnect between 
the fact that intelligent material is out there and being produced all the time by academics living in this country and speaking in the American idiom or translating from Israel into the American idiom and things like this. So there is, it's there if you want it, but how many people, look, I teach this stuff. How many students do you have that are actually very interested to make this part of their life? So this is the, the, the uh, dissonance, I suppose. In general, serious and thoughtful non from Judaism did not fare well in the era of modernity, which after all, in the era of modernity, now we're now in not modernity, we're in postmodern, as I'll say in a minute, for those who don't know it. The era of modernity would be like the 50s, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, that kind of time. Uh, which after all, in those years, and anyone who's old enough to remember will remember this, it promised a real utopia right here and now in Elam Hazard. I mean, we had presidents of the United States in those years who said, we can conquer poverty and we can do it now. Can you imagine a president who would even talk anywhere near those terms today? You see what I'm saying? We can go to the moon, we can conquer poverty, we can create a utopia in this country. Um, in those contexts, religion, especially now from Judaism, was an embarrassment. Unless it embraced modernity and totally de-emphasized the God stuff. A couple weeks ago, maybe last Shabbos, two Shabbos ago, I saw by Jonathan Rosenblum in the Mishpacha magazine. It was a surprise to me. He said he was a young guy, I didn't know he was that old. Um, I remember as a very young person, back in the early 60s, the Commentary magazine sent out like a questionnaire, I don't know, to 50 or 100 Jewish intellectuals in America. What do you believe? What's your relation to Judaism? Stuff like that. And apparently he was a, a teenager and part of that group, Jonathan Rosenblum. And of course he wasn't from at the time. And you can, re again, if you're interested in this, I recommend anybody who's an educated person and wants to see something interesting, you might turn your stomach a little bit, but interesting, go online and you can find, you know, Commentary Magazine, I believe it was in, in, in uh, 64, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was called The State of Jewish Belief or something like that. And you can see, yeah, okay, so he remembers it. Anyway, and the point's like this. They had, I'm guessing, 100 people, 50 people, whatever it is. Now, obviously, Norman Lamb was a from guy and, you know, uh, you know some, some person like that. But I'm talking about overwhelming majority is uh, disgusting. So I don't consider Jews to have any part of me. Uh, you know, it's, it's not part of real life. The world needs a real solution to problems. Um, I don't like Israel anyway. Uh, I remember there was a former rabbi saying, so Israel should go out of business because they're mistreating the Arabs. This is before the 67 war. It's unbelievable, you see? It's one after another after another. You have to have a strong stomach to go through all this. Uh, but that is where the elites were. Because the people at Commentary Magazine are writing to are not the average person out there, but were, you know, movers and shakers across the country. A lot of clergymen, a lot of academics, a lot of prominent public figures, and so forth and so on. It, it is interesting, you know. And the Jonathan Rosenblum column, if I remember correctly, was, you know, uh, looking back on it or something like that. Uh, so, my point's like this. 64 would be the peak of modernity. That's when Johnson's re-election. That's when had the Great Society. And I'm not blaming it on Johnson. I'm talking about the, 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 the mindset of, you know, America and all this, which is we can do this here and now. We can, we, we can solve everything. It was all a lie. It was all fake. They couldn't solve it, just like they couldn't win the Vietnam War. But I'm talking about the way people talk to themselves. In Yiddish, you say, Zich Eingeret. Kennedy, as you all know, made that famous speech, America is willing to bear any burden, carry any load, do anything it takes, you know, to, to make freedom around the world. No, we're not. <laughs> it's a lie, you know? And by the way, thoughtful people at that time said that, but, you know, nobody... Paid. I'm simply saying, because you don't make these generalizations, but it sounded good, you know what I mean? You know, he, he had a good speech there. Now, because um, we can't fight the whole world. We can't bring freedom to the whole world. You see? Even Kennedy didn't say, we're going to go to war with China to, to free the Chinese people. Yeah. <clears throat> My point is, the classic liberalism of the modern era argued that people can create utopia here and now to abandon that enterprise and to turn inwards to theistic religion was an inexcusable escape from reality and an abandonment of fundamental humanist responsibility. This is the attitude that comes across in these interviews and a broader section, I'm just using this as an example, an easy way to access the state of mind of people, of intellectuals at that time. How can you waste your time with this Jewish stuff when 
there is real problems here in America that need to be solved now. Okay? Hence, there is no room for philosophical, theological speculation. How can one fiddle with thoughtful speculation on Judaism and Jewish abstract ideas while America is burning with injustice, which cries out for radical action right now in the spirit of Martin Luther King? Okay? So that is much more something I, as a Jewish intellectual, want to get involved in than a question about Abraham or something of that nature. And so we have the old problem that King Solomon wrote about thousands of years ago, where he said, Salmoni no terras akromi, but kindly showed no tarti. They made me the guardian of everybody else's vineyard, I never took care of my own. Okay? This is the classic indictment of the Jewish liberalism. Maybe Salmoni no terras kol akromi, I took care of all the karams. Karmi shalilu no tarti. I never got around to taking care of my own. But these intellectuals didn't see it that way. They would regard somebody like me as beyond the Flintstones, you know. Now, such Ashkafas came to dominate the American Jewish intelligentsia for the most part. These were the best and brightest people. They were the graduates of the Ivy League universities and so forth, for whom creative solutions might have been expected, but they didn't try. So this is just interesting I'm raising. What would have happened if the best and brightest of American Jews, best and brightest, not from, would have really cared about Jewish survival and things of that nature, and got together in serious sessions and try to come up with creative ideas, what would, what would they have come I can think of one guy who's atheist, who came up with one interesting idea, and that's uh, Steinhardt, you know, the zillionaire, and he created the birthright. You see? It's an idea. It's a very good idea. You know, in other words, unfortunately, he's an outlier. It's, it's, it's one, one idea. I'm sure I told you many times. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't solve the problem, but it definitely is a step in the right direction, in my opinion. I've been relying on the fact that you'll forget what I've said in the past. Uh, that years ago, um, when I did a short trip to Israel, on the way back, we came back uh, at the same place with a, with a uh, birthright group coming back from Stony Brook. That's a, a state university in New York. And Karen was talking with them, and all my wife's more of a schmoozer. And, uh, and she's talking with these you know, young American Jews who just been on the birthright thing. He said, you go to Israel? Oh, yeah. How was it? Oh, we hit every bar in Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv Haifa, and Jerusalem. What about, what about the Kotel, the Western Wall? We did that too, you know? <laughs> all right, fine, fine. So my wife said, I would never talk this way. My wife said, has this trip in your opinion, affected your relationship with Judaism, something along those lines. And I'll never, this I'll never forget. The guy who's the head of the group, you know, he was a young college guy, you know. He said, it's made a big difference in my life, a radical difference. I gotta tell you, it's a game changer. As a result of this trip, for the first time in my life, I am prepared to seriously consider the possibility of dating a Jewish girl. You see? Now that's one guy Michael Stone, with, with, with the, you know, that, that's where things are holding. And so from the point of view of non-Orthodox American Jews, he needed a bunch of people with a lot of ideas. And perhaps, perhaps they could have come up with something. Uh, it's not my group, so I can't participate. You know, so I'm, I'm from a different group. But I'm Jewish, I'm interested that their group should do better Jewishly. <laughs> you see? Uh, but, it, but most of the people are out to lunch, meaning they're involved in other activities for the better utopian societies and things of that nature. Now, um, they rationalized and they valorized disengagement from Judaism and Jewish affairs, and that's how it went, okay? Now, then came postmodernism. By the way, in our time, you hear of these guys popping up to go against Israel. That's all of a sudden, that's all of a sudden they discovered that they're Jewish, but that's another story. Then came postmodernism, because Actually, you and I live in what we call postmodern era. This is when it became clear that the dreams of modernity were not going to work out. Civil rights did not result in an integrated society. The great society programs became cesspools of urban corruption. The Republican Party and conservative thought made a comeback. So did religious fundamentalism in much of the world. Socialism proved a dud in America and around the world. The rise of Islamic extremism was unforeseen. All these were beyond 
this, the, the imagination of Kennedy and Johnson and that whole group at that time. The new revolutions in the West that come in the late 20th century are not the Marxian types, which are political revolutions driven by economic considerations. They're social revolutions, most importantly sexual and homosexual and all that goes along with that. And now lately they're adding to it white privilege and that whole business. In other words, it's more of a dystopia than a utopia. And in the midst of trying to get a handle on all this postmodern crisis, thoughtful Jews, educated Jews, were not wrestling with the Jewish cultural questions. The federation system, which was run by Amaratsev, was not equipped to deal with this. They simply can't deal with, you know, how do we get you guys more engaged with inner Judy? <laughs> That's not their skill set, okay? And this leads us to the 1980s and 90s. The 80s, as we will recall, were a prosperous decade, but had an ugly side. Money earning, tens of millions on Wall Street, vulture capitalism, and materialism dominated much of American culture. Here's an uh, iconic guy, remember him? <laughs> right. Okay, so I mean, what, 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 what's the message that goes, you're gonna get it all no matter how you get it, you see? But as we all know, the boom was over by the late 80s. So that's why Bush was stuck with a bad economy. The militantly, by the late 80s, early 90s, the traditionally militantly secular Jewish leftist organizations were gone, were in the process of leaving this world. You know, the workmen's circle, the socialists, the this, that, and the other. They were dying either from aging or they were dying because those were the years the Kremlin fell apart and you saw the discrediting of socialism and communism. There's no way that they could sell the young when the ideals of their youth. Those people who died in those uh, workmen's circle home died very bitter. Perhaps the new generation of young American Jews, now that we're in the late 80s and 90s, will turn aside for a moment because the economy ain't what it was to contemplate the relationship with Judaism and Jewish culture. Maybe they will turn out as the generation that will wrestle with fundamentalism and other coordinate Jewish notions, even to reject them. Hopes were high among Jewish intellectuals. At that time, hopes were high that this is something that might break out. But then, right at that moment, American non from Jewelry, Jewelry got hit on the head, or in the side of the head, by a big stick, and that was mass intermarriage. And that's the numbers we saw before, okay? It's a game changer. When I say mass intermarriage, I'm talking about marriage to a partner who does not convert to Judaism. I'm not referring to people who convert reform conservative, that's a separate issue, I'm not dealing with that now. I'm talking about people, because when they talk these numbers, 72%, they're not talking about people who get a reform conversion. They're talking about people where the spouse, let's say it's the girl, she's not interested in converting. So he's Jewish and she's Methodist. He's Jewish and she's Catholic. That, that, that's, that's how they're going to do it. Okay? I don't know if you remember, who was Bush's press secretary? Fleischer, right? Yeah, exactly. Bush's secretary. I remember, I, I saw it on the internet. He got married. It was a rabbi and a priest. Um, wait a second. He got married. It was a rabbi and a priest. She was a Catholic, so they had a half Catholic ceremony. It was a Catholic ceremony. But listen to this. Since he's a descendant of the Baal Shem Tov, they had Hasidic greetings. Okay? You're laughing, but, the, but, you know, but, but, but this was in the New York Times. I'm trying, so that's what I mean by intermarriage. Okay? Now, these numbers just exploded. It quickly rose, as you saw before on the charts that I showed you, to between two thirds and three quarters of the total young non from population. This is unprecedented. This didn't happen anywhere that I know of. Okay? I don't know of any country where you have 70% or more of intermarriage. It's like I said before. <laughs> I don't know what happened. My son must be crazy. Met a Jewish girl, met a Jewish girl. I, I don't know how that happened. It wasn't my fault. You see, it wasn't my fault. So that kind of situation was not the norm. If you remember the, the numbers, it was 18%. And that's a lot too, but I'm saying 18%, less than 20%. So that means four, in, in those days, up to 1980, four out of five Jewish boys married Jewish girls, four out of five Jewish girls married Jewish boys, okay? And you know, if you want to play the numbers, if you take it back 10 years, it was a little less. But from 18% to almost 80% or 70%, that's, only, that's different. That's different. The Jewish Federation establishment in the 80s and 90s found itself faced with a crisis it structurally could not address. If it's, if it's subscribed to the supremacy of individual autonomy, 
which in America you have to. The supremacy of individual autonomy. I'm a free citizen, I can do whatever I want. Are you opposed to me doing whatever I want? You're trying to take away my American rights? In that case, it's outrageous to criticize one's marriage choice. So how are you, as a federation or something like this, going to criticize people? At the heart of the matter, the emperor had no clothes. In other words, if you do reject fundamentalism, talk on what basis can you criticize intermarriage? You say, well, you're betraying Jewish peoplehood. The young boy who's 20 years old, 22 years old in college says, what is Jewish people? I never heard you, mother and father, mention that word before. You know, what is that? You understand? It's not like these kids went to day schools. I mean, I'm not talking about the kids who went to Solomon Schechter and the reform equivalent of it, although that was, didn't turn out great either. But look, on the, the overwhelming majority of young people in American Jewry, five, six million Jews, don't go to anything, as we all know. It's their public school. Okay? So where would they hear, if you didn't go to any kind of Jewish schooling, where would you hear about Jewish people, Jewish peoplehood, and all the rest of it? Okay? Remember, most kids went to public schools, not to Jewish schools. These parents, and you know I'm right, these parents have always wanted their children to mingle with people who are not Jewish. They want them to go to public school, right? Thereby learning how to get along in life. I've met so many people like this, and you probably have also, and when the day school movement started, you used to run into people like this all the time. He said, I want my kids to be able to, you know, I don't want them to go to school in a ghetto. It is a strongly held belief of American Jews throughout the 20th century, public education. This is one of those basic features of 20th century American Jewry who feels that this stops anti-Semitism. They'll grow up, they'll have non-Jewish friends, they'll know how to get along with people, all the rest of it, they'll be more normal, and this will make less anti-Semitism. Which, by the way, may possibly be right. Possibly. It is the reason the reform and conservative movements could never make a success in the 20th century of any kind of day school systems like the Solomon Schechter. There's a few Solomon Schechter, and many of them are closing now, but I'm just saying, even in the heyday, there was a couple, but not broadly across the country. Nowhere near, I mean, it's a joke even to compare it to, let's say, for example, Termasaro, you know. Now, traditionally, these Jewish parents all across America in the 20th century had sent a complex message to their kids as the kids were joining the melting pot, as you see up here. And, you know, I want you to integrate with them, be friends with them, party with them, but don't marry them. How's that work? It probably never was realistic. It, after all, defies, defies human chemistry. Agree? It defies, I mean, how do you do that? How do you do that? It collapsed in total in the 80s, starting in the mid-80s, I think. Um, this in itself is not surprising. It's human nature, meaning boy meets girl, compounded by an anemic Jewish identity in the part of the young, anemic and full of ignorance. The interesting, the sad object of the historian's observation is the reaction of the parents and of the establishment, both religious and the federations. Let's look at the denominations. The reform movement and the conservative movement, well-funded, well-organized, but helpless in the face of this crisis. You see, here comes something very interesting. One essential difference, not the only one, one essential difference between the Orthodox rabbinate and the Reform and Conservative rabbinate is in the feature and the function of criticizing the laity. Okay? It is the job of an Orthodox rabbi to criticize his members. That's always been the way it is for 2,000 years. That's what they do. And the people are supposed to take it. You can grumble about it. You can complain about it at your Shabbos table. You can, you know, borch about it behind the guy's back. But that's all part of the game also. That's how it was in Prague in the 1750s. That wasn't the time of Moses, all the rest of it. But the job of the rabbi is telling what you're doing wrong. Okay? And, you, and part of the Orthodox culture, you're supposed to take it. So the Gemara famously says, Haitzum Rabbana de Merach Melebene Mosa. It's well known. Any rabbi that the people in the city like him is a bad sign. It's not because he's a good person. He doesn't give him hell. And his job is to do that. You see? Now, well, that's just interesting. The Rishwal Salanter famously is supposed to have said that, you know, any community that the rabbi is like is, is, is no good, on, it's, it's not a good sign of him. But any community that he gets fired from is also no good sign of him. You've got to walk the line. 
You see? Now, that is, for example, historically speaking, what the Shabbos Shuvah Russia was and the Shabbos Agod Old Russia was back in the old country. In other words, there was a time we didn't give so many speeches, but when you did, one component of it is to talk about the Lumdus and so forth, you know. That's the old school. One, you know, the three, four hour speeches that were delivered twice a year. But, uh, five hour speeches. But part of it is, also. Here, here's what you're doing wrong in Shabbos and in Kashrus and Loshahara and boys and girls and this and that and the other. It's a laundry list. The historians love these sorts of things. Because you look at the old dresses from Abishitz, from Nerevi Yudah, from the Ramah, from anybody else, you see what was the problem at that time. You get it? And the people, as they expect, to sit there and take it. Like I said before, doesn't mean that they get in lockstep and so forth. That depends on every rabbi, every community. But this is part of the life. This is not possible in non-Orthodox shuls. That is not the culture. You get fired. That is not the culture there. Never has been. Hence, the Reform and Conservative rabbi has been emasculated, castrated. It cannot criticize the members of the synagogue. You can only praise. The only thing you can criticize is something that everybody wants to criticize. So if you're in a Democrat shul, it's, it's kosher and expect that you should criticize Trump. If you're a Republican show, it's kosher and expected that you should criticize Biden and so forth, or Hillary. That's how you, no, you can, you can criticize what they want you to criticize. You see, so the whole quality has a faux quality to it. You understand? So, so by the way, this is the reason, if you read that article last week, why so many are quitting, yeah. right? If you, some of you, I think, took what I said and re read it. By the way, the Jewish Times put that article in, but they censored it. Yeah, if you look at the original, they cut out the good parts because I'm serious, I'm serious, you can do it yourself. You go to the trouble of opening the Jewish Times on the one hand and go to the Times of Israel on the other hand and compare the text because they're the same article and you see where they, where they cut out, okay? And they cut out precisely these parts. For clarity. No, yeah, okay, have it your way. <laughs> right? Now, uh, you no, know, what I'm trying to say is like this. So you can't be honest, you know? You, 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 after a while, a certain type of people say like this, I get a paycheck, but I can't stand it anymore, you know? Now, so whereas once upon a time long ago, the consensus of the members was against intermarriage should a rabbi could preach against it. So if you met, went back 100 years, or 60 or 70 years ago, yes, the reform rabbi and the conservative rabbi would preach against intermarriage. And that's because the consensus of the Balabat was also against it at that time. Because the intermarriage rate in those days was 5%, 10%, something like that. So it was understood, this is a message you get from your clergy. By the 80s and 90s, when so many children and members were intermarrying, the rabbis can no longer say it's a, good, a bad thing. Since they couldn't criticize, they could either, A, ignore it, so, you know, talk about something else. It's a lot to talk about. Or B, speak positively. How do you speak positively? You look for the silver lining in the cloud. And so you say, we have mixed couples here, we welcome them, uh, radical hospitality, uh, we want you to join, um, everything you do is good. And so, well, I'm saying, this, this is the, what else you do? We, we supposed to, you, know, you want to keep them? We want to kick them out, drive them out. You know, what, what else are you supposed to do? Always say the glass is half full, <laughs> or a third full, or 1% full. <laughs> but don't criticize anybody, because you can't. It was your job. This latter started to become the fashion. Okay? Hence the reform movement but get benefited because they could always be no more nimble than the conservative. That's why Rabbi Rick Tank was the other head of the, he talked about, we're gonna have radical inclusion now. It means your wife could be not Jewish, but she can still be president of the show. That's what that, that's what that means, okay? Um, and things along those lines, the radical inclusion. Well, I will tell you something. This was a winner for the reform and a loser for the conservatives. Because since the reform movement, I don't want to be cynical and say it has no principles, but they have no, no red lines. Everything goes. So the conservative movement is unfortunately never bound with a called halakha. It's hard to make a case in halakha that you have a mixed marriage. Okay? And more importantly, you can't perform a mixed marriage. Okay? So it can't be that a conservative rabbi can do Ari Fleischer. You get it? I'm doing it together with a priest. At least that's the rules of the conservative movement. So a ton of people from the conservative shoals 
It's like this. I want to, my, my, my kids are getting married. The rabbi said, I'm not allowed to do it. I'll go to reform. So one of the reasons, this is just funny. I mean, it's not funny, but you know, it's strange. One of the reasons you have such a precipitous drop in the conservative movement between 1990, let's say, down till today, when they went, I think the market share was 43% or something like that, down to 13%. It's not because everybody's joining NCSY. I wish that were the reason. But they're, no, they're joining the reform. Get it? So the reform then can say, I guess, we're expanded. We're doing great. Because their numbers, if you look at the Pew and all, if you, if you go by the world of numbers, you see, their, their, their numbers are great. Now, it's a bunch of baloney, but their numbers are great. And the conservative Nebuch are getting it on both ends. You see? Uh, because they're trying to go against something they can't do. Now, the, the reform movement is really fake math because, let's put it this way, the people they're counting in their numbers as Jewish are totally not Jewish. The guy in Gomorrah, that's number one, by choice. And number two, these families that they're counting as Jewish are bi-religious, <laughs> right? Bi-religious. You have a menorah and a Christmas tree. And what's the problem with that? You have Passover and Easter. And, and what's your issue with that? Okay? And believe me, if the rabbi will come and say, I guess, I think you can get a red Christmas tree, oh boy, you can't do that. Well, hell break loose. So my point is, there's, so, so it's, that's what I mean by fake math. So we have 40%. Not really. Not really. You're lying. Which means that one day the whole bottom's going to fall out. But until that day, it'll look great. Just the next day. It'll be like the crash of 29. Everything is great the day before, and then boom. But these are the trends of our lifetime. My point is that it was in the late 20th century when these movements, for the first time, gave up the struggle against intermarriage on a large scale. First of all, as socially unstoppable. As Rick Jacobs said, you can't fight gravity. That was his words. And second of all, it clashed, once you get to the late 20th century, with American civil religion, which was about to start seriously evolving. Now, America's always had a civil religion, meaning what we call politically correct values, okay? Um, among non-Orthodox Jews, American civil religion has always trumped Jewish religion. That's why I said before, you want to go to public school, and you want your kids to be in Boy Scouts, you want your kids to do this and that and the other. You have to adhere to the, the civil religion they've always taken very seriously. The Jewish religion, not so much. As we shall see next year, the Bill Clinton years, which is the 90s, saw advances in American culture in which the homosexual re revolution became an integral part of American culture, culminating later in the Supreme Court ruling that gay marriages are protected in the United States Constitution, which is quite an argument. Right? I don't think Brandeis can imagine that one, but that was not that long ago. This trend destroyed the pre previous playing fields. Okay? I mean, that's, these, are, these are social, they're sexual, they're social revolutions of a huge nature, even though they involve violence. Homosexuality became positively embraced by reform conservative in the federations. You and I have lived through this. This is a particular revolution that we have lived to. We know what it was like long ago, and we know what it's like today. It's very different. It became one of the Ten Commandments of American civil religion, I would say today. That homosexuals are entitled to full rights and, and, more, than, and more than that. Now, listen to this. If it's okay to be gay, even to be married gay, to a, a guy with a guy, a girl, a girl, how are you going to condemn intermarriage? <laughs> You see, that's what I mean by it just destroyed all the previous frameworks. It's a new day. You understand? So you say, okay, my, my uh, daughter didn't marry somebody who's not Jewish. She just married another girl who's Jewish. The parents say, oh, good, I'm glad she married somebody Jewish. The whole, no, I'm just saying the entire framework, no, but I'm, you can laugh all you want. You know and I know this is the reality out there today, okay? And therefore, all the things I started with, with Herzl, it's a new day, okay? It's a new day. And it has shredded the frameworks which used to hold together the non-Orthodox segment of American Jewry. That's my point, okay? And therefore, they're like floundering helplessly, to be perfectly honest. Um, now, 
Therefore, I said that tonight's thesis is that the disintegration caused by mass intermarriage, disintegration caused by mass intermarriage, number one, dates from the late 80s, and number two is a game changer whose results I predict will manifest themselves over the next decade or two in our kids' our lifetime. Our children and grandchildren, I think, will grow up in a very different American Jewish community. But on that note, I've used up my time, so I'll say you good night.